Welcome to Sunday Bible Study here at Emmanuel Lutheran Church. If you missed this Sunday's Bible class, here's a brief 15-minute recap of what you missed. I pray that this study is edifying for you as you seek to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as always, we'll open with prayer. Lord, to whom shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. We'll begin our study this week at Mark chapter 6, verse 14. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some said, John the Baptist has been raised from the dead. That is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. But others said, he is Elijah. And others said, he is a prophet like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For it was Herod who had sent and seized John and bound him in prison for the sake of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted him to be put to death. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Jesus' fame had spread up and down Israel and even outside of Jewish territory into Gentile regions. And so the rulers had heard of Jesus. As we see, King Herod himself knew of Jesus' reputation, King Herod being the sort of puppet king over Judea for the Roman Empire. Now the people had heard all about Jesus by now, but many did not know what it all meant. In fact, some were thinking it might be John the Baptist come back from the dead. Now, there's a, a bit of dramatic irony being utilized here, you know, that literary device where the readers are aware of some information that the main characters are not aware of. Of course, we know that Jesus is not John the Baptist come back from the dead. After all, we've seen them both together at the same time already in this gospel. But the speakers here, they did not know that. But it is odd that they're pointing to the miracles as proof that it might be John the Baptist. After all, the baptizer didn't perform any miracles. In the Gospel according to John, we can read about him. And they said, John did no sign, but everything that John said about this man was true. Now, if you recall, the main question being addressed throughout the Gospel of Mark is, Who is this Jesus? First, the disciples were the ones asking that question. Remember when they were out on the boat with Jesus and the wind ceased and they could only reply and wonder, who then is this? And naturally, now the people are asking, who is this? Is he John the Baptist? Others are asking, is he Elijah? Which at least makes a little bit of sense since Elijah did perform miracles by the hand of God. And also Malachi, the last prophet in the Old Testament, had spoken of Elijah who was to come. Others thought that Jesus was simply a new prophet, you know, just like many of the prophets of old. But they still didn't know who he was, and speculation was running rampant. But for Herod, Jesus' identity was not a question. Evidently, his guilt had been gnawing away at him. He was the one who had had John the Baptist beheaded, and he knew what was very wrong at the time. And now he's convinced that this was John the Baptist come back to terrorize him. Now, the story of, story of Herod and John the Baptist is that John had reprimanded Herod for his very public sin of adultery. Herod had a brother named Philip who was married to a woman named Herodias, and Herod took his sister-in-law from his brother and married her himself. And it's really even much worse than that. You see, Herodias was the granddaughter of Herod the Great, and both this Herod and his brother Philip were the sons of Herod the Great, which makes Herodias their niece. Yikes, you know, just terrible all around. And so John had brought the message from God that Herod was sinning against God. You know, even in front of the king, John did not shrink back from bringing the reprimand of God's law. And it's a good reminder to us that when it comes to sin and breaking God's law, we ought not to shrink away from any opportunity to warn others of that sin, which would separate them from God for all eternity. Rather, as equals... We can carry that message from God to them. After all, Paul writes to the Romans, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. Now we learn that Herodias was none too pleased with all this talk of, of sin that she was intimately involved with. And she wanted John dead, but we're told that Herod was actually protecting him. And this is interesting. We're told that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. And Herod had come to know that John was right, and even though he didn't like the substance of the message as it pertained to him, he still wanted to hear it. 
It was all a, a very perplexing situation for him. In the book, uh, The Proper Distinction Between Law and Gospel by the renowned early American Lutheran theologian C.F.W. Walther, Walther writes, The law may be preached to the most ungodly person, and his conscience will tell him that it is true. But when the gospel is preached to him, his conscience does not tell him the same. The preaching of the gospel rather makes him angry. The worst slave of vice admits that he ought to do what is written in the law. Why is this? Because the law is written in his heart. And all people have the law of God written in their hearts. We call that their conscience. And so when you preach the law to them, they intuitively know that the things you're saying are true. After all, it's been bugging them deep down in their conscience already. And perhaps that is what's going on here with Herod. He knows these things and he knows that they are true. But that's not the same thing as hearing and believing, for he rejected the gospel. He refused to repent and receive forgiveness from his Savior. You know, James warns about this approach to the word in his epistle when he says, Be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror. For he looks at himself and goes away and at once forgets what he was like. Herod gladly heard the word, but in the hardness of his heart he did not act upon it. He rejected God's message for him and so he had John killed. And we read about that sad account in the following verses. So picking back up at verse 21. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his nobles and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. For when Herodias' daughter came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it to you. And he vowed her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you up to half my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, For what should I ask? And she said, The head of John the Baptist. And she came in immediately with haste to the king and asked, saying, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And the king was exceedingly sorry, but because of his oaths and his guests, he did not want to break his word to her. And immediately the king sent an executioner with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl, and the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard of it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. So we're told an opportunity arose. That is an opportunity for Herodias to do something about that John the Baptist problem that she had. And it came on Herod's birthday. Now perhaps we can get a bit of an insight into Herod with this birthday party. It does not appear that it was ever Jewish custom to celebrate birthdays. This was a Roman custom as well as a custom in other Gentile areas. So perhaps he was only trying to be more like his Roman leaders in throwing himself this lavish party. And at the party... Herodias' daughter came out to dance. Now, if you're keeping track at home, this daughter was presumably the daughter of his brother Philip, making this his niece. But as she's also the daughter of his other niece, Herodias, this also makes this young lady his great-niece, while also being a sort of stepchild to him. Clearly a messy, sinful situation. And yes, that dance that she was performing was not an innocent one, but a provocative dance intended to be seductive to everyone in attendance. It's just not good all around. Now, relaxed as he must have been by, by no small amount of alcohol, I imagine, Herod has now moved his attention on from his niece to Herodias to his other niece slash great niece, and he drunkenly offers her, ask me whatever you wish and I will give it to you. Even up to half of his kingdom was the bounds of the offer. The young woman, she goes to her mother to gain her recommendation, and Herodias seizes the opportunity. Get me the head of John the Baptist, she says. It seems apparent that Herodias had orchestrated this whole ordeal, and things probably worked out even better than she had you know, most wildly hoped for. So the daughter, she goes back in pretty quickly, immediately, we're told, just after the offer was made, and demands the head of John the Baptist. And you can almost picture the situation. Herod drunkenly laughing with his friends, celebrating his party, you know, looking lustfully and stupidly at this young girl as she approaches with her request. And then you can see that lustful glimmer in his eyes suddenly fade, along with the smirk on his face when he realizes what he's done. And remember, he did not want any harm to come to John, but now he's stuck. He's given his oath to the girl, and he's done so in front of all of his friends and his peers, and so he feels like he has no other option but to do exactly as requested. And perhaps we should take the opportunity of Herod's poor decision-making to consider our own sinful decisions when those moments of intense 
peer pressure brought us to the confrontation between you know, what we knew was right and what the crowd wanted us, wanted us to do. You know, how often have we piled on with, with gossip or taken another drink or, or not obeyed our parents or superiors simply because we felt the pressure of what others wanted us to do? You know, Paul warns us about this in Romans 12 when he says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. To be conformed to this world is to save face at any opportunity before your fellow man, uh, to preserve your own image in their eyes. And certainly, we all have much to repent of, and we would be negligent to consider Herod's failings without considering our own, and then taking those sins in repentance to our Savior and receiving forgiveness from him. Back to our account. The request is made. Herod is very sorry, but immediately the order is given. I'm sure no explanation was given to John as his death was immediately forced upon him. But I also suspect that this was not a surprise to John as he was the forerunner of the Messiah. As John had said, he must increase, I must decrease. And he knew that Jesus had come to be the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The sacrificial, the sacrificial Lamb for all time and for all sin. So naturally, John likely knew that as the forerunner, he'd be going before him into death. But even as we see you know, the sorrowful end of the to the life of John the Baptist, a life that you know, snuffed out simply because Herodias wanted to silence him, yet John could not be silenced. His words were recorded in scripture. His message, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It has continued ringing out through the centuries. It's a good reminder of the truth that God declares through the mouth of Isaiah the prophet. All people are like grass and all their faithfulness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall because the breath of the Lord blows upon them. Surely the peoples are grass. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Now, the world can try as it might to silence God's word, but God's word will continue in spite of the world's most sinister efforts. And certainly that's good news for us. Now, the early Christian church father, John Chrysostom, once remarked on these, you know, these sad events at the end of John's life, pointing our attention away from the sorrow of this story to the correct direction. He said, Therefore, do not say, Why was John allowed to die? For what occurred was not a death, but a crown, not an end, but the beginning of a greater life. You learn to think and live like a Christian. You will not only remain unharmed by these events, but you will reap the greatest benefits. I don't think I could see it any better myself, so we'll just leave it right there. Uh, that then ends our study on Mark chapter 6, verses 14 through 29. I pray that this has been beneficial to you, and I look forward to diving in more together with you next week. In the meantime, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.